So yeah, so good to see you all here tonight. Um, and my heart really over this next three nights is to kind of normalize the subject that we're going to be talking about. As Philip has alluded to, we're talking about sins, wounds and demons. And indeed, when we hear the term demon, oftentimes we're thinking about all sorts of mystical um, things, um, all sorts of dark things or whatever the case may be. Um, and we just want to try and bring a bit of light to this and again to normalize this and to let you into the reality that this should be our everyday existence. We should be able to minister effectively um, as the body of Christ to those who are struggling with sin issues, um, struggling with wounds, and indeed who are demonized and wrestling with the demonic. This should be our everyday experience of knowing how to effectively bring people into freedom. And indeed, this is the mission statement of Messiah, and it's the mission statement over this house. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Notice the words. To proclaim freedom for the captives, and a release from darkness for those who are bound. First, we want to bind up the brokenhearted. That's healing. That's healing of the wounds. The second we free is to proclaim freedom for the captives. That's freedom and victory over sin. Total emancipation. Because Jesus Christ has paid in full. Amen. In full. The price for your sin and for mine. And the last wee statement, and release from darkness for those who are bound. That's those of us in this room tonight who may be under some form of demonic oppression. And so there it is. There it is on the wall, um, kindly painted by Janet. Good to see Janet here tonight. Um, and we continue to pray for her to step into full healing in Jesus' name. And so that's really my mission, is to try and normalize this, is to try and take the spooky out of it and realize that each and every one of us here tonight, we have an authority in Jesus. Yes. Jesus died upon the cross. He rose again. He ascended on high. He is seated in glory at the right hand of the Father. And he has given to his beautiful bride the keys of the kingdom. And so he has given us this authority and he has given us a power through the Holy Spirit to be effective witnesses in this community. And so that's what we're going to press into. And tonight our subject is sins. And if you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And we're going to think about an individual called Simon. Really interesting guy. And we're just going to journey through his um, life for a moment and draw some truth out of his own experience. And indeed, we'll hope that that will be a benefit and a blessing to each and every one of us. We're going to be dealing with sins tonight. And I'm going to try and make this as simple and as practical to everyone in the room. And hopefully by the end of this, we'll be clear as to where we stand. And indeed, this in and of itself will bring freedom to each and every one of us. So the Bible says in verse 9, Now there was a man who lived there who was steeped in sorcery. For some time he had astounded the people of Samaria with his magic, boasting to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest among them was dazzled by his sorcery, saying, This man is the greatest wizard of all. The divine power of God walks among us. For many years, everyone was in awe of him because of his astonishing displays of the magic arts. But as Philip preached the wonderful news 
of God's kingdom realm and the name of Jesus, the anointed one, many believed his message and were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon believed and was baptized. Wherever Philip went, Simon was right by his side, astounded by all the miracles, signs, and enormous displays of power that he witnessed. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had accepted God's message of life, they sent Peter and John to pray over them so that they would receive the Holy Spirit. For they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and were yet to have the Holy Spirit fall upon them. As soon as Peter and John arrived, they laid their hands on the Samaritan believers, one after the other, and the Holy Spirit fell and filled each one of them. When Simon saw how the Holy Spirit was released through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he approached them and offered them money saying, I want this part too. I'm willing to pay for the anointing that you have so that I also can lay my hands on everyone to receive the Holy Spirit. Peter rebuked him and said, your money will go with you to destruction. Or as J.P. Phillips translates that, to hell with you and your money. (laughs) How could you even think that you could purchase God's supernatural gift with money? You will never have this gift or take part in this ministry for your heart is not right with God. Repent this moment for allowing such wickedness to fill you. Plead with the Lord that perhaps He would forgive the treachery of your heart. For I discern that jealous envy or root of bitterness has poisoned you and binds you as a captive to sin. Simon begged, Peter, please pray for me. Plead with him so that nothing you just said over me may come to pass. We know the Lord will bless his word tonight. One of the most important things that we need um, for this ministry is the gift of discernment. Each and every one of us have got to learn how to hear from the Holy Spirit and we've got to learn (coughs) and discern what it is we're actually dealing with. As you read through Simon's life, you'd probably kind of come to a conclusion, and rightly so, that this guy potentially had a lot of demonic issues. He's dabbling in stuff that he shouldn't be dabbling in. He's crossing a line. He's crossing a boundary. He's up to his eyes in witchcraft in that sense. So when you see something of his life and his character, you probably think to yourself, hmm, something going on with you, lad, in the context of the demonic realm and what he's opened himself up to but it's interesting when peter comes to deal with him and by mind you peter knows how to deal with him like he's not too shabby about getting in there and making it very clear and that's what we need more than anything when we preach the gospel we cannot be afraid to call sin sin and call it for what it is and in this case peter filled with the holy spirit does exactly that. Now you would think that he would start to deliver this guy from demons. You would think that maybe he would go into generational um, issues or wounds or whatever the case may be. But no, he makes this very clear statement. For I discern, notice what he says. For I discern that jealous envy or a root of bitterness has poisoned you and binds you as a captive to Sin. It's sin is the thing that he goes after. Because sin is a very, very serious thing. In the eyes of a holy and righteous God, sin is a serious issue. And it's serious enough for Jesus to go to the cross and die to pay the penalty in full for that. 
And so he goes after this whole concept of sin. And so what does that look like for us? When we talk about sin, what exactly does that mean? The Bible describes sin in three ways. It uses the word sin, S-I-N. And in old-fashioned days, you used to have um, a thing called archery. I think you still do. You can do it up near Magara if you want to during the summer. And what used to happen was you would have had a guy who had a crossbow or a bow and arrow, and he would have stood and he would have shot this um, arrow at a target. And if he missed the target, there would have been a wee guy, wee umpire, standing beside the target, and he, target, and he would have shouted, Sin! Sin! And what he was actually saying was this, You missed the mark. And that's what sin means. It means we have missed the mark. The Bible is very clear. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have missed the mark. The Bible also talks about transgressions. And transgressions is that part of your heart that is inherently rebellious and it's almost like there's this little fist inside your heart that kind of looks up to God at times and just shakes your little fist at him and says I will not do this I will not submit to you I will not go your way and that's inherently what transgressions mean and then to finish we have iniquity and iniquity is something that is deep rooted inside each and every one of us it's the birthday present you like that we received from the enemy <laughs> and it's inherent evil and it's often connected to generational issues generational problems and it's often passed from one generation to the next. And so here we have this whole concept of sin and what this thing looks like. And the Bible's very clear. And Peter says it here tonight in verse 22 to Simon. Repent. Repent this moment for allowing such wickedness to fill your heart. That is the clear biblical antidote for sin. That begins the journey for you, if you like, to follow Jesus. When Jesus Messiah came, that was the cry. Repent now for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the message has never <coughs> changed. Repent. And so what does repent mean? There's actually two Greek words for repent. The first one is metanoia, which basically means changing your mind. Sometimes, you know, Phil would text me or phone me up and say, you know, Mark, we're going out to the sea for a wee swim. <laughs> At maybe six o'clock in the morning. And I might think to myself, I'll go with him, and then I see him going in, and I quickly change my mind. That's a changing of the mind. That's something that I believe is empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's a gift of grace where he helps you to make a categorical decision to say, no more. I'm going to turn, I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to come into agreement with the Lord and get on his page and follow him. The second little meaning of repentance is this. It's metanoi, not ah. But it comes with a sense of sorrow, a sense of grief. 
a sense of understanding that I have offended this God, this one who has blessed me with life itself, this one who has given me so much, this one who is so kind, who is so good, who has proved his love to us time and time and time again. Because the Bible says he demonstrated his love toward us. Even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's the truth of Scripture. And in this context, this is what Peter's saying. Repent. But it comes at this individual, Simon, with a sense of, Simon, recognize where you are today. Recognize the decisions that you've made. Simon, now's your moment to step into the fullness of this, to be forgiven. But more than that, Simon, I want you to start taking responsibility for the situation. Because when you notice, when Simon hears this whole concept of what it is to repent, and I need to do this, and I need to trust in this, and they need to follow what the Holy Spirit is leading Peter to say. The last wee verse in 24, verse 24, Simon begged Peter. He says, you pray for me. You pray for me. <laughs> that these things that you've spoken over me or spoken about me would not come to pass. Why, Simon, wouldn't you step into the role and start to own your own stuff? Simon, in an instant, passed the buck. Peter, you pray for me. Peter, you do it for me. Peter, you have a wee word in his ear and sort this whole thing out. Do you know why? Why should I? And so you can see in this moment... Peter's inviting this man into a situation where he's simply saying, listen mate, clean your mess up. Take responsibility. If you've done something, put it right. If you've done and offended somebody or said something or done something that you know is wrong because every single one of us in this room tonight we have been given this thing called a conscience and to have a to have a conscience that's alive to have a conscience that's pure and operational is a beautiful thing it's such a gift from the lord and so when your conscience starts to be pricked when you start to think about stuff that you've done the things that you've said the the, the whatever, whatever that you find yourself in, you've got to start listening to the voice of conscience and stand up and take responsibility and own your stuff and put it right. Yes. And that's the invitation to this man, Simon. But for so many of us in the room tonight, and I know something about this, and maybe you're sitting here and maybe you're in the situation where you're saying, Mark, listen, hold on a second here. That's okay for you to say all these things about repent and stand up and take responsibility and own my stuff and all that sort, of, that sort of jazz. I've done that. And still I find myself in bondage. Still I find myself struggling with difficulties and issues and all the rest. And I just cannot seem to get traction and I just cannot seem to get rid of that thing that is blocking me, that barrier to blessing that people keep talking about. And I just want to simply talk about three things. And three things that were very much pertinent in my own experience, and I'm sure they're your experience here tonight. And the first one of them, that, that basically it almost causes people to stop, to quit, to give up. I can't do this Christian life. I've tried it. I've, I've, I've worked hard at it. I've, I've, I've trusted. I've prayed. I've read my Bible. I've done all those sorts of things. But this thing kind of causes people just to stumble and fall and just give up. <coughs> and it's perfectionism. Perfectionism is the first thing. It's basically believing in your heart that no matter how hard you try, you will never attain the level of perfection required. 
And so you work hard, you strive, you try and perform, you try and make it to the bar, make it to the level. And yet, somehow you keep falling flat on your face. And perfectionism is not just a high flyer thing. It's not just um, something that um, affects the, the famous or the, the business orientated individual who's made a fortune or whatever the case may be. Because a lot of those individuals are driven by perfectionism. The bum, the outcast, the down and out, they also <laughs> suffer greatly with perfectionism. If I can't do it, what's the point? K. G. Jesterson, I can never say his name. J. K. Jesterton. Yes, that's it. I have the same problem. I can't do it. I've given up. I'm a perfectionist. I've given up. I'm not going to say it no more. But he said this. He said, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing well. No. It's not what he said. Yes. He said, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing it badly. That's counterculture to how we think. But you get his point. His point is, take the invitation. Step in. Give it a go. Keep going. C.S. Lewis said some of the greatest books in history were never written because of perfectionists. And what happens is you've got to keep writing, you've got to keep trying, you've got to keep giving yourself to this thing until something good comes. And once something good comes, you're on a winner. But for so many of us in the room tonight, we give up because of this cursed thing called perfectionism. The second we thing is a thing called introspection. And this was something that I really, really struggled with. Introspection. And it's this capacity within each and every one of us to look inward. To constantly dissect ourselves up on our own table, if you like. We're constantly looking inward and looking at the things that are just not good. And let me tell you something now. We can all do it. And every single one of us, you can... Be introspective to the day comes, but you'll never find anything good in there. And if we're going to fully press into emancipation from sin, the first port of call is this. We've got to start looking up. We've got to start looking to Jesus. We've got to stop looking inward because all we will find is junk. Psalm 139 is very clear. David says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. I'm going to read it to you. Because I've never actually read it in this. This is good. And this is the way we should start to operate. Inviting Holy Spirit to come and you do the searching. God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. I actually think there are some here tonight and you're afraid to do that. It's like you're afraid to allow God in there. To search your heart. Because you're afraid of what he's going to find. Because the truth of the matter is he knows what's there. God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through. Find out everything that I may be hidden that may, sorry, find out everything that may be hidden within me. Put me to the test and sift through all my anxious cares. See if there is a path of pain I'm walking on. And lead me back to your glorious everlasting ways. The path that brings me back to you. And that's the invitation tonight. 
Lord, I'm not going to do the searching anymore. I'm going to invite you in. And let's face it, folks. If we're beginning this process of sanctification, this journey of inner healing and deliverance, we've got to know where to start. You've got to know where to start. I always remember that um, film War Horse. Ever seen it? Yeah. And there's a, there's a moment in that film, in that scene, where the, the Jerrys are on one side and the Brits are on the other side. Excuse me for my PC political correctness, but <laughs> the Germans and the British. The and there's this incredible moment where there's a horse. It's the star of the, the film. And the horse, of course, goes on this journey and gets lost and finishes up on German lines and British lines and back and forth and back and forth. But this, there's this moment where the owner of the horse, he's in one of the um, trenches and he hears the horse and he whistles to the horse or shouts to the horse and, of course, the horse recognises his name and it jumps out from behind the trenches in the Jerry side of things and runs across what's called no man's land. And it's, it's pitch black dark, so it can't see where it's going, but it gets halfway through and it gets caught up in all this bob wire. And so you hear this horse moan and groan and it's a really sad scene, but the horse is trying to get out and it can't get out. And of course, there's a, a sense of empathy and sympathy from the Germans on one side and the British are having this conversation. What's that noise? What's going on? Who's making the racket? Blah, 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 blah. And they all decide then, well, in fact, yeah, to send up an individual to see what's happening. So the Brits send somebody up and the Germans send. And these two guys meet enemies, sworn enemies, but they meet at the centre of no man's land and they realise it's a horse. And I think the British guy, he, he realises that they're going to have to start cutting this thing out of the bob wire. And he shouts for these wire cutters and about 20 wire cutters come over and they pick up this, and the German guy's just about to get stuck in, cutting anywhere, it doesn't really matter. But the British guy goes, no, 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 we need to work this out. Because if I cut there, that might cause more pain. That might cause more damage because of the pressure. Because of the pressure. And so they work out a strategy with regards to where to cut, and they slowly but surely start to cut the wire and they work their way into the middle where they get the horse free. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with you tonight. But we got to know where to start. And we got to know how to do it because he knows how you got there in the first place. He knows the decisions and the choices that you made that caused you to be in this situation of bondage at this very moment. So he is the one who knows how to take you out. Yeah. And so that's why the invitation is here tonight. Stop the introspection thing. Quit that. Start looking up to Jesus. Start inviting the Holy Spirit into your heart. Start asking him, where do I begin? I feel like this tangled up ball of wool. And I feel completely unraveled. And I'm a bit like Humpty Dumpty who fell off the wall. But all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. But I know one who can put you back together again if you give him the opportunity. The last wee thing is passivity. Perfectionism, introspection, passivity. I do think that Simon suffered a bit from passivity. <laughs> he kind of checked out of life a wee bit. He kind of shunned responsibility. And maybe that was to do with his upbringing. Maybe he had a mother who smothered him. A mother who practically did everything for him. To the point where what was bred within his heart was this kind of spirit of entitlement and this passivity where he just expected everything to happen for him. And he wasn't going to, if you like, stand and take responsibility and own his own life. 
And maybe that's you tonight. Maybe that's been your experience where you've had a mother or a father who's just overprotected you, has smothered you, hasn't given you room to breathe, has stifled you, has literally lifted and led you. And now you're in a position where you're just stuck. It's almost like your will has just completely laid down. And I've seen it in ministry time and time again where people are so passive in the will, you actually have to start praying for their will to their, to, to their will to be strengthened, for their will to be strengthened. So passive it has become. And even our theology can, can make us passive in some senses, where we just believe that God's going to do everything for us. We believe that God's just going to zap us and put us back into place like that. And none of us want to kind of move into a process with God and, and kind of move into this thing called sanctification. And let me tell you, folks, the only way this ministry truly is effective is you actually having a vibrant, loving, active relationship with Jesus, walking with him day by day with the Holy Spirit and under good tutelage and leadership and hearing the word of God being preached, all of these dynamics coming together attuned to this ministry will bring you freedom. This ministry in and of itself is not the be all and end all. So don't be coming here thinking that if God comes and zaps me, that's it all sorted. No, God can do that. Absolutely, he can do that. He can come, he can light upon you. He can change things, he can move things, shift things, heal, deliver, whatever the case may be. But oftentimes, it's a journey. Oftentimes, it's a process. And so he's inviting you into that. Don't be one who is stuck in passivity. Who's just lying back expecting everything to happen for you. And the way this works. And so that's the three things that often snare people and did for me many times, especially introspection. I spent years looking inward and not finding anything good and being haunted by what I seen. Haunted by the reality of my humanity by the reality of my brokenness. And so to finish tonight with two things, we're going to look just for a moment at confession and the power of confession. And the Bible is very clear. Turn to First John chapter 1. In verse 9. But if we freely admit our sins, when his light uncovers them, he will be faithful to forgive us every time. God is just to forgive us our sins because of Christ. And he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we are not guilty of sin, when God uncovers it with his light, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. I just wonder, has the Lord done that recently with anybody? Has he pointed to something in your life? And you know that you know that you know his fingers on that thing and he wants you to admit it. To come into the light. To step into the fullness of this so, sal this so great salvation that he offers. If he exposes something if his light exposes something it's not to bring guilt and shame and condemnation God is not into that the enemy is the one who's into that the world system they're into that but the Lord is not into that he's gentle 
He's loving. And he's pointing something out because maybe that's your starting point. And for many of us in the room here tonight, we, 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 we are probably quite happy to confess our sins to Jesus. That if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <coughs> And I've seen it so many times, brothers and sisters. I've seen it so many times. I've seen the power of confession. There's just something about speaking it out that brings a release, that brings freedom, that brings cleansing. And you can trust him that if you're brave enough to, to confess your sins, you're confessing your sin to someone who can do something about it. That's the incredible thing. He can do something about it. You're not confessing your sins to a priest or to an imam or to whoever or whatever or some guru online. You're not doing any of that stuff because they can't do a thing about it. Amen. Not one thing. But when you confess your sins to Jesus, you're confessing to, to one who has borne your sins, who's taken your sins upon the, the tree. He's done that for you. And so because your sin effectively has been removed from you, that's a beautiful thing. You're sitting here tonight carrying stuff that you were not designed to carry and you shouldn't be carrying because he's already carried it. He's taken it from you. But because of your mindset, because of the patterns of thinking and the way you think about stuff, you're still walking in old mindsets, old patterns of thinking. Destructive sometimes. And what he wants you to do is just to simply bring you out of that destructive pattern, renew your mind in that context, break down all the strongholds that have been built up around your mind. And maybe many of you here today are just constantly running down these railway tracks, if you like, this, this, this way of constantly thinking about things. If something happens, if there's an incident that takes place in your life, you constantly think down the railway track and, and that track may be called fear. And there could be another track called anxiety. And another track called anxiety or, or anger. And it's just your go-to. It's your automatic response. It's the way you go. But the problem is, is that the enemy has so seductively sown a lie into your mind and you have believed a lie. And what he does is, is then around the lie, he builds this fortification called a stronghold. And this stronghold is developed in your mind that you constantly run around this thing. You constantly think like that. And because he's inside of this thing, he's inside of the stronghold, you can't get to him. And you can't get him out. The Bible is very clear that Jesus has come to tear down strongholds. Amen. To break you free from those patterns of thinking. To release you into a kingdom mindset and the mindset of Jesus. Last we think, if we confess our faults or sins to him, he will forgive us. And, and, and some of us in the room tonight are very good at that. And comfortable with that. Comfortable with confessing our sins to Jesus. Me and Jesus are sorted out. Me and Jesus are cool with this. We can do it. We don't need anybody else's help. <laughs> don't need anybody else's help. And some, some people think like that. But then you turn with this, I am finished, to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 verse 16 confess and acknowledge how you have offended one another and then pray for one another to be instantly healed. For tremendous power is released through the passionate, heartfelt prayer 
of a godly believer. It's interesting that that verse is right in the middle of a passage about healing. (laughs) It's right in the middle. And I know that there's been a lot of spiritual abuse in the church. And maybe you're one of those individuals tonight who you've shared your heart with someone and and you've practiced what the Bible teaches, that you've confessed your faults to one another. You've confessed, you've shared your deepest, darkest. And that person has potentially betrayed you or maybe gossiped it around the church, gossiped it around the community, and it's just devastated you because you thought you could trust them. And they've broken your trust. And they've shared things that they had absolutely no right to share. And so when you hear something like confess your faults to one another, you're like horrified at that. Horrified at that. And I know what that's like. I remember the first time I ever confessed my faults to someone. It nearly killed me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I trembled and I shook like a leaf. But the release that I felt in that moment, (coughs) when I actually got it out there. And again, it's, it's confessing your faults to someone who can do something about your fault. Like you only confess to someone who can actually do something about it, who's anointed to do something about it, who's walking in the fullness and power and demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit who understands the depths of the gospel. Sometimes for maybe some of you in the room tonight, you've confessed to people who couldn't do a thing about it. Maybe even some of you here tonight are caught in bondage of confession. And you've confessed to the wrong people and you've ended up just so wounded and broken because of it. Maybe you just need to start confessing to the Lord. (laughs) Work on that and then confess to one another. But the bottom line is this. Is it this tonight? This place. This is a safe place. It's safe because Jesus is here. It's safe because the Holy Spirit is present and he simply wants to do business with you tonight. And the invitation is clear. The invitation is clear. This could be your moment. And maybe you've imagined all sorts of ways in which you'll be set free. Maybe you've imagined all sorts of patterns and you know, you've, you've dreamed up all sort of, sorts of scenarios like if I do such and such or maybe again God's going to zap me or if I'm... Maybe all the Lord's asking you to do tonight is confess. Maybe that's it. Just simply own your stuff. Admit, here I am, broken. Well aware of my need. And I don't know how this works. I don't know what this looks like. But tonight, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to make a decision that will change my life forever. And maybe you're here tonight and you've never actually trusted in Jesus. Maybe you're here tonight and, and you've never actually made that decision to trust him but not only trust him give your life (coughs) to him that's different the Bible is very clear that we've been called to lay down our lives in such a way that we can at some stage when we enter into glory pick it up again and pick it up in the newness of life 
And so let's just for a moment bow our heads in his presence.